Good evening. I'm Tom Hill, and it is my very proud moment to introduce Jordan Castile tonight. Now, you all know her many accomplishments as an artist. Born and raised in Denver, she recently had a exhibition just two years ago at the Denver Art Museum, Returning the Gaze, her first major museum exhibition, which traveled to uh, after Denver to the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford. She's the granddaughter of the legendary 1960s civil rights leader, Whitney Young, who turned the National Urban League into a formidable organization to promote equitable access to socioeconomic opportunity for those historically disenfranchised in the United States. Her grandmother was a board member of the Metropolitan Museum. Jordan received a BA from Agnes Scott College in Georgia, MFA from Yale School of Art, and was the artist in residence at the Studio Museum in, in Harlem. Jordan now lives in New York City, where her second major exhibition 39 of her extraordinary paintings are currently on display at the new museum. Now, you, you all know Jordan is a figurative painter who brings her own vocabulary and unique you know, image to painting portraits. Influenced growing up by Ramar Bearden, Faith Ringgold, Jacob Lawrence, and many other prominent artists, she was recently chosen along with Kerry James Marshall by Vogue magazine to paint a new portrait for the cover of like iconic September issue of Vogue. Both these artists were granted full artistic license to choose whom they wanted to depict on their cover. As long as the subjects wore a dress by a Vogue curated designer. Now Jordan chose the designer Aurora James who's wearing a pyre moss creation. Jordan chooses her subjects with great care, whether there are her art students in the course she teaches at Rutgers, her mother, her friends, or someone she meets on a walk near her home in Harlem. She paints her subjects with feeling, compassion, and embodies each figure with humanity and soul. In these horrific pandemic conditions of isolation and often desperation, Jordan has remained active in her work and has found refuge in a house in upstate New York and managed during this period of time to announce her engagement to David Schultz, uh, who's an extraordinary guy who I've also gotten to know. In this period of social distancing, Jordan is going maybe to choose herself as her next subject and paint her first self-portrait. I can't wait to see it, Jordan. Now. I have enormous respect for your art, but most importantly, I value our friendship. I cannot think of anyone more deserving than you to deliver the Demetrian Lecture, which is named in honor of the Hirshhorn's esteemed former director, Jim Demetrian, who invited me to join the Hirshhorn board almost 25 years ago. So Jordan, take it away. You're in good hands with Melissa Chu. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Tom. I'm really glad that my camera was off because I was kind of, um, my palms started sweating just listening to what you were saying. It's quite phenomenal. So thank you for doing well, that. Well, Jordan, when we had dinner here in our apartment, right before COVID, you know, David was with you uh, and we had a number of people from the museum world. Uh, we had Christopher Wool. we had a number of people. And I have to say, uh, you know, it was so wonderful to see you, you know, with the person you love in this environment. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure for the last seven months, you know, it's been really hard. So uh, anyway, I've been thinking about you. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Tom. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, great to hear from you as always. Um, so Jordan, we're on for the James T. Demetrian annual lecture. Tom mentioned that uh, Jim Demetrian is um, in fact 
the longest serving museum director of the Hirschhorn. And so this annual lecture is really designed to honor him. And we're so happy that you're with us tonight. I think that we got to know one another just last year when you were one of the honorees for our New York Gala and you nominated Faith Ringold to be with you. And um, we were able to see your wonderful exhibition at the new museum. And so we thought that we would love to spend some time with you this evening. In some ways, it's a bit of a two for this evening because we're fortunate enough to have a little bit of a view of Jordan's studio back there. The studio happening right now. He's <laughs> hiding the painting that <laughs> she's on right now. Paintings are in front of me. Not see it, it's up to her side. <laughs> and, but we do get to see your working environment. So it's great to have that. Um, have that inside view um, but we also we were kind of preparing for tonight and there's a little known um, fact in common that both Jordan and I are twins but we promised not to reveal any of that weird twin magic powers we <laughs> promised that we would not reveal that tonight we're going to focus on Jordan's work um, and in some ways, Jordan, you've been really at the forefront of a new generation of painters, a new generation of an appreciation of figurative art. And so for that reason, we wanted to start tonight with that amazing crossover moment that Tom mentioned and we were speaking about before, um, the crossover moment between the art and fashion worlds where you were um, kind of issued an invitation. And we might start with the first image here um, where Vogue invited um, you as an artist and Kerry James Marshall also did a portrait. But we'd love to hear from you because uh, in an unusual way, um, it is art on the front cover of a fashion magazine. And Rick Powell, one of our wonderful Hirschhorn trustees and a real scholar of black art, mentioned that it was earlier in the 20th century when art was more apparent in fashion magazines, whether it was commissioning for Harper's Bazaar and others. And the great thing about this is that you were able to choose your subject and yep. then paint her, Aurora James. Tell us about this process because I think we're all very curious to hear how it kind of all worked. Um, I, the universe has divinely uh, come together collectively to make this happen in a way that I still can't entirely wrap my head around. But the bottom line is, is if my phone rang, Dodie, um, who wrote a beautiful profile on me a few years ago in Vogue. Yeah. She like gave that. me a call um, quite out of the blue and said, are you available to have a conversation this evening? And I, of course, I mean, I adore Dodie and I said yes. And um, immediately we got on the phone and she said, I have something to propose to you that is um, going to be quite overwhelming potentially, but is potentially also very monumental for Vogue that they don't do this, uh, what they're going to offer you, they don't traditionally do. Um, but as a result, I think you have the capacity to do um, really something phenomenal, if not different than what's been done before. So she said that the museum, or not the museum, that the, the, see in my head, I'm like museum, that the Vogue, Vogue magazine, that the institution of Vogue had decided on two artists to paint the cover um, of the September issue, that they were gonna highlight the works of two artists and that it would hopefully be a new work and that the only thing that was going to be prescribed by them was that they were gonna offer me a list of designers and a few pieces of clothing and that the, the person featured on the cover would be wearing the, the work by one of the, these designers. And I chose Pyre Moss, um, that was pretty easily chosen. And then second to that, I chose Aurora James. I was given complete wherewithal to make the decision of who it was that I wanted to paint. I could have painted anyone really, whether it was my mother or uh, my best friend, Alex, I could have gone in any direction. But part of my intent and thinking about um, saying yes to this opportunity was to take advantage of what this could mean to someone else and how I could use this platform to continue a conversation that is meaningful to me as well. And that being around black economics and the supporting of um, 
really generational wealth and filling the gaps that historically have existed for black and brown communities. And I saw through all of our time alone on social media, I've passed the, the great Aurora James in various different capacities in my life, but I reached out to her. It just felt obvious. It was, this was a woman who with the 15% pledge, I was seeing turn um, her concerns into real action and seeing what other people were doing and how I could put my um, positioning behind them to create more fervor around the work she was already doing was really important to me. So I chose Aurora um, for that reason because of her work with the 15% pledge where she's asking major retailers to commit to 15% of their shelf space to black and brown owned businesses that making a real clear intention to um, commit their, put their money where their mouth is and give back to um, black lives. Um, and I love that. So I reached out to her, I gave her a call and said, I've been given this opportunity, would you say yes? And I think she sounded as confused as I did when I first got the call, call <laughs> because I was sure there would be more parameters than there were. And um, once she said yes, I said, great, we basically have to shoot it tomorrow because I have three weeks to make the painting. Um, and it was just the two of us on her rooftop. My partner, David, who's a photographer, came and took some behind the scenes photos, but I took the actual photos of her that became the reference material for the painting. Um, and we joked kind of quite cavalierly on top of this roof that there's no way that any in the history of Vogue, a September issue, there were only three, two people involved in the making of that. There wasn't hair, there wasn't makeup. We were literally calling Pyra Moss, uh, Kirby saying like, is this how you wear the dress? Um, we were in complete control. We were just kind of going for it, which is the essence of my work. If it wasn't for that um, and feeling that I could make the choice around who it was that I wanted to represent and do it the way that I do it traditionally in my practice, I'm not sure I would have said yes. A huge part of who I am and, and the way that the practice has evolved is about being taking these leaps of faith and getting to know people through the practice of painting them. And that's exactly what has happened with Aurora James. So that's what I was going to ask. So much of the writings about your work are really about you knowing the subject. Yeah. Um, in this case, it was more knowing her work. And yeah. I'd love to hear about what that getting to know her process was. And maybe we turn to the next slide, which is more of a process um, yeah. that shows the work. Um, I often say that I get to know someone in that you know, the 20, 30, maybe hour I spend with them photographing them initially. But there's only so much you can get to know in those kind of fleeting instances. It's the opportunity to sit and paint them afterwards and to share the painting with them and to engage in a longer conversation and to kind of live the life of this painting together that she was involved, I, I communicated where the painting was going, that she will be involved anytime an exhibition is on view, that I make a point of kind of keeping the people who are represented in the work engaged long term. I, it is no fleeting moment for me. But I, I come to know her most intimately when I'm in front of the canvas, dissecting every fold and shadow and thinking about how I, I experienced her and wanting to have that reflected on the canvas, that mm -hmm. um, she, she was very confident. It felt like she was lifting up off of the space and her, her commitment to her ideas was really empowering to me. And I wanted to translate that kind of one black woman to another that I was seeing myself in her. Um, and she was reflecting back onto me as well, that it was a, a uniquely and intensely collaborative experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this exactly this kind of structured beginning painting where you see me sketching it out and I'm, I'm really thinking about how the environment will suit her, that her, the dress I wanted to kind of feel like the, the sky was billowing it through her body, that it translates from the sky onto her dress and down to the ground um, as she reaches for it, literally pushing on those toes. So I, I, Things were happening naturally for her. I wasn't telling her how to sit or how to be, but um, I was paying attention and being a keen observer of the choices she was making in order to find the ones that I thought could best be highlighted to tell the story I wanted to tell. Mm. And, and did you think about, as you were painting, the fact that the destiny of this work in a way was different from had you been painting another work 
to be shown in a gallery because in a way it was commissioned to be reproduced and to be reproduced on the cover of a magazine. Yeah, I, so I often, I do think a lot about how accessibility and the exit, ex- or really the lack thereof sometimes of the art that I make, um, how distant it feels at times from the roots and the places where I was first inspired, that um, having access to a museum or feeling comfortable in institutions, although there are real strides being made, haven't necessarily allowed a whole lot of room for people such as myself to exist. That even with a family lineage, that there were certain rules or parameters that I was trying to understand. And when making a work of art that's going to be reproduced on this level, it is the epitome of of creating a work of art. The number of people who have DM'd me or reached out saying that they bought the cover and then have since framed it, and that their their sense of connection to the work of art and then owning and feeling a sense of ownership over that work of art is a real gift. I, I can't ask for anything more than that. Of course, it scared me. It was deeply intimidating. I knew I was entering a realm of kind of cultural relevance or lack thereof uh, that is different than when I'm just functioning in my art world bubble that my nephews joke that like they can google me and that's the only moment that I like suddenly seem important but vogue to them like it's like oh like I guess my auntie is actually of important. I'm like I've been trying to tell y'all that I do this you know, every day <laughs> you've been but saying it for a while but, <laughs> yeah, but it, it reaches the everyday experience in a really unique way that you can be walking down the street and see a vogue magazine in hanging in, uh, I guess, a bodega or magazine store wall, that it becomes the public and the private become blended. And I think this work is ultimately for everyone. So that is a gift that I couldn't have imagined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Shall we turn to the next image? Because we're keen to get into, um, you know, your, I always feel like there is an element of storytelling, maybe even attached to some of these works, given your you you know, unique individual relationships with each of the subjects. Um, tell us about Jared and your process with him. Uh, tell you about Jared. To tell you about Jared is to tell you about the love of my life outside of my fiance, potentially. But um, Jared is the doorman of my building in, in Harlem. And mm-hmm. he's somebody that I have gotten to know over the past four years that I've been in this particular building. And have really come to love. He knows my family quite intimately. He knows my friends. We spend time um, together outside of the work environment that my days begin and end with him. And he has been one of my biggest fans, so to speak, that he's very aware of what is happening in terms of my career. He came to the opening at the new museum. He was the first in the door and Um, I have said to him on a few different occasions that painting him would be something I'd be interested in doing, but I don't think there was a certain amount of seriousness uh, absorbed on his end initially when I was saying that, which isn't necessarily uncommon. I think if somebody were coming to me and saying, I want to paint you, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, okay, like, yeah, you want to paint me. Um, But there's a certain gesture of love that comes from taking the time, just like Aurora, even whether I knew them intimately before or not, that it is an act of um, real grace or loving in saying that I want to spend time with you for an extended period. And, And I believe that you are a powerful enough human being who deserves to travel the world and be seen by the masses. And Jared is one of those people. So this is in the front lobby of my building. Um, It's always interesting because I, I make it make a point to say to all the subjects, you know, however you envisioned. He knew I was coming that afternoon. We had set a date and time that I was going to come downstairs with my camera. And he said he wanted, he has the Superman, this like life size, well, it's not really life size, but when he puts on that trash can, it is life size. Um, The Superman, he is Superman. He always has a Superman tie on. His connection to Superman, I ultimately found in the act of making this painting is much deeper than I realized before that he identifies with him as an orphan, as somebody who is taken um, the worst circumstances and turned them into light. And I didn't know that about Jared. I knew he loved Superman. I knew he was like a gaming nerd, but I had no sense of the depth of his experience and, and connection to that. And so painting the Superman, when he pulled him out and said, you know, I want him to be a part of this, that he goes and gets the flowers every day. So we made a point of putting the vase. So he brought the Superman in from home. Oh, no. so that yeah. it- well, it, is, it lives at the front desk so that when he's working, it comes out. 
So like it, it's his, that Superman is his, um, <laughs> but it lives in the like mail room and he pulls it out when he's on duty. Um, so it's just like, it is who he is. And I wanted him at rest and at leisure and in control and to feel as much jovial, but also in, in real power, like a king, that the light behind him, I was thinking really intentionally, kind of art historically, thinking about a halo or a glow behind someone's head, that thinking about kind of the, the glow behind him um, as being a really intentional gesture to honoring or knighting this king in my life, mm. uh, somebody who has been of great importance. I mean, the other thing that occurs to me is that um, when you live in New York and there's a doorman in your building, that person knows Everything. everything about your life everything what you shop for now given online shopping they know your yeah. comings and goings they know who visits you so there is an incredible kind of intimacy between totally. that role within the building both you ways. And absolutely yeah. whether i've there have been times that i was crying for who knows what and i was alone in my apartment for who knows why. And I went downstairs to be with somebody and I went to sit with Jared um, because I knew that I would be loved and safe there, that yeah. he evokes that for me. And, and that is an, that's a very special relationship in that circumstance. And how do you countenance the response of the subjects to the painting when it's complete? Do you show them, you know, how does that, and do you, or does it differ with each subject? Because that's a very, I mean, you've described it as quite an intense, intimate experience. It is different, I think, for every yeah. subject. Um, for Jared, he knew I was making it. I'd sent him, I make a point of sending progress images. I sent him all the photographs I had taken because my, I'm an amateur photographer. It's like, if you want the photographs, you can have them. Um, and the painting is this thing that, the size is usually the first thing that catches people off guard, whether they're the subjects in it or not. I think the scale is a very intentional choice of mine. Um, and, and that was one of the first things that he observed, but he came, we chose a time he lives in the Bronx and we picked him up from his home. My partner and I also work together in the same studio space. So we picked him up from his home and brought him here to see the painting. And um, I'm trying like to say it without, like he got emotional and as did I, that, um, I think that those are really remarkable experiences um, that I'm, I'm utterly grateful for. And yeah, I, I then, yeah, yeah. Should we turn to the next one? Yeah, because I got stories, truly I have stories for everyone. So. I know, we love it. So <laughs> tell us about this uh, trio. Yeah, so this um, represents Medge, who is in the floral red shirt, is a student of mine that I had at Rutgers University in Newark, where I teach currently as a painting professor. And her mom, Wanda, is seated in the middle, and her sister, Annalise, is um, to the far right. And um, I, this was the beginning of me representing my students and thinking about um, really honoring the relationships that I build with them in these really enclosed and intimate spaces. One day a week, we spend six hours together. Well, now COVID, it's a little more complicated. But mm -hmm. at that time, we were spending six hours together and getting to know one another. But there was always this hurdle of real understanding of one another, our, our existence was solely within the space of the university. And I, I cared and was curious a lot about who they were when they left. It's just like, who am I when I go home? Um, which is the basis of a lot of the work that I make. It's like, who are we in our most intimate and vulnerable spaces, particularly as people of color? Um, and so Medj is represented at home and, um, she wanted her mother and her sister to be a part of it as um, the anchors in her own life. And she, I mean, there, yeah, there are instances where we kind of laugh because you can kind of feel that Medge was very prepared to be photographed and painted that day. She has lipstick on, she's wearing her grandmother's shirt. She has these nice shoes, her legs are crossed. She was like prepared for me to show up. Um, whereas her mom and sister, I don't think she told them until I showed up that they were actually gonna be included in the photograph. Um, and both of them having their shoes off to be at leisure in that way is really quite beautiful to me. I, I think also about kind of the dreaming space and the present space. There's this painting in the background that feels like a European landscape and then to have that reflected in the ground and the colors of the ground and the shadow, I mean, 
I loved making this painting um, because of the feminine energy that they exuded and how I personally felt particularly connected to that and their love for one another. Mm -hmm. Also the way they're like sandwiching or kind of standing by their side. Yeah, they're very close and next to their mom. It's a way, I mean, Wanda is centered in that in a very particular way um, that is hard to ignore. And she is clearly the matriarch as a result, that um, the love and respect for her is, is great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, um, it strikes me that gender seems to also play a role in maybe how you approach the subject or think about it when you're painting each person. How, how, do, you, how do you come at that? Um, in what sense? I'm curious about... Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about your earlier works that really focus on male nudes. Mm. And then there are a lot of portraits of women. Um, very few of them are nudes. Yeah. And so I feel like often with, with, a, with an image like this, for example, it's very, that, that fa- familial bond is very strong. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just thinking through how you, how you as an artist, if, if gender plays any role when you are thinking of the composition, the placement, how you approach the subject. Yeah, so I think that, right? yeah, I, in the earliest work, which we will kind of get to in the end, I think there was real intentionality in kind of identifying a subject that I wanted to portray. But even in that intentionality, I felt really clear that gender and the way that gender functions is um, is the way that we make assumptions around gender or gender the subjects or gender me and my name being Jordan for many years people thought I was a man making that work and the way that we make assumptions about who has the power to represent who, um, who has the power to engage or kind of offer their gaze on another body or person um, is is of great importance to me. And I'm always interested in kind of turning the page on uh, the things that people think are normal or expected or um, historicized or valuable. And so for me, I don't think really explicitly about gender when I'm making the work. What I am acutely aware of is my own kind of centered or way way of relating to my own center of gender or relationship to femininity. And that is always going to be a part of whoever I represent. As a result, I see if we're to gender any of these paintings, they would all be uniquely feminine because they're being translated through the lens that is uniquely my own, that my hands is laboring (laughs) and my memory and my experiences are being imbued into the surfaces of these canvases that the mark making itself um, feels full of me and that's the only place that I think gender exists explicitly in my experience of the work or the way that I'm making it I'm not necessarily um, feeling tied in one direction or another that there are certain conversations that I'm trying to have or people that I'm trying to highlight based off of my engagement with them and in this case it was my students Mm -hmm. Um, and A lot of them, if they have another person in it, it's the matriarch, it's their mothers, which it doesn't mean that the fathers weren't present or there were just choices that they made that I honored. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, yeah, it's mostly about trying to honor people as they want to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Consuela, I love, I mean, I love this painting. This is another student? Yes, this is another student um, who is represented in her home in New Jersey. And when I went into her apartment, um, she shared an apartment with her mother and all of the walls from floor to ceiling were covered with three years worth of painting she's done with me. I mean, literally, she is one of the most prolific artists I've ever known in my entire life. And I tell her that frequently because every week she, I'd come in, she'd have like 10 paintings done. And I was like, what is happening? I, I'd never given the advice to someone to slow down as much as I gave to Consuela. But at the same time, slowing her down, I saw as a hurdle to her need to express her kind of like creative energy and drive. And um, it felt like her canvases were her diary. She often was writing on the, you can kind of see in the backs 
of the paintings behind her that she's written, I tried to transcribe her writings onto those surfaces. And I, I was texting her as I was making it. And I was like, I have a whole different level of respect for the work that you make now that I've spent five hours trying to get, you know, this language written on a straight line in the back of this canvas. Um, and then in the foregrounds, you see her two tubs that she had set up as her easel space where she would create the works for class. Um, and the one thing she really wanted to represent outside of her work, which couldn't, we couldn't ignore regardless, was that giant panda bear, which she said that she- so What's that all about? She just loves it <laughs> and she wanted to hold it. And it's one of those instances where, um, how can you not say yes? And um, what I love particularly about this painting is the relationship between that teddy bear and the youthfulness that that represents. And then the aging or the, her as a young or older, or not really older, like a woman, she is a woman holding that. Um, and there's a real love and tenderness in the way she's holding it and in her own gaze and the smirk in her, in her face. And um, yeah. Well, it also indicates um, a sense that she's in her most private space in a way because she's an adult holding the panda bear. Absolutely. You know, it's not necessarily that you would do outside of the home, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or you would, I don't know, you know, to each his own and I'm willing to kind of okay. meet people where they are, I guess. But yeah, there, it does. I mean, it, it feels very domestic and private and intimate. Well, and her sitting on her bed, I think is also with her shoes on um, that, I think it is in reference to the blending of what is um, a sleeping space versus a working space. And sometimes those spaces, especially in times like COVID, where we're literally all things are now happening in the same space. All conflated. We're all at home right now. <laughs> exactly. That the intimate is becoming very public. That my studio, which is usually an invited space, becomes a public space. Um, and that's what these paintings also, in some ways, they give me permission the subjects within the work is giving me permission to um, investigate. And, and there, I have an immense amount of respect for the level of vulnerability that that offers. Mm -hmm. Shall we move to the next image? Minnesota. Yeah. Like it's on New York subway. Yes. So it definitely is on the New York subway. And this work was recently featured as a part of the public art funds, um, I can't remember the name of the exhibition right now, but they were all over the, the bus stops and the kiosks in New York City. Um, and I kind of explicitly chose this work to be featured in that way around the time of George Floyd, um, thinking about Minnesota. I had taken this image. It's a perfect kind of example of the fact that oftentimes the way that we absorb the world or that we're walking by spaces, we're not and acutely aware to the way that they might be foreshadowing or speaking to us explicitly about what the needs and wants of specific communities are. Um, not that this young man was wearing a Minnesota hat knowing what was going to be down the pipeline, but um, there is a conjuring that can happen, I think, through the act of making paintings and the photography and the kind of documenting of time and space and then reflecting back and pulling images out of the archive for paintings and, and the relevance now. Um, a fun fact is there's, if you, in the background behind his head is me with my headphones on wearing a hat, um, being reflected in the glass in the background. So I I, I've that, yeah. sort of been literally portrayed in that painting, which felt really important to me in making this work in particular and thinking about um, that although the things and the people we are talking about feel far away, it is very much um, my bloodline and um, it's quite close, in fact. So this painting, I think the neon colors, thinking about the hazard, for me, thinking about like hazard lights or the hazard signs and the reflective quality of things and um, especially like bikers and the way they can reflect the reflective material that is in an effort to protect oneself. Um, but there's only so much protecting we can do at times. And the very authentic kind of dingy lighting of those kinds of um, train cars that are yeah, all over yellow. <laughs> yeah, not our best light. This was also a, an occasion where you didn't necessarily know the subject. You, you took this kind of surreptitiously in the subway, is that right? Exactly. And that's why this is, 
this part of my practice, I think of as being very much intertwined with the, the overall practice, that it is a part of a sentence that I'm trying to convey. Um, it might be an and or the two or the, or the Minnesota, but it is a part of something larger. But these gazes aren't engaged in the same way for that very reason, because it's the reciprocality um, is lost. It's a fleeting moment in which I have the opportunity to really reinvestigate and to think about the environments that I have passed through quite quickly um, and then reflect upon and find that there was a conjuring, in fact, in my recent past <laughs> moments that feel very present now. Mm -hmm. Shall we move to the next year? Yeah. I think this, this is another thing just because it's so, um, it's so different compositionally from the other works that we've talked about tonight, just in terms of it being so uh, cropped. Yeah. So close. Absolutely. And I think that this is the perfect example. I started to say when thinking about Minnesota that um, part of my investment in that work and the subway and these cropped paintings is an opportunity for me to exist solely as a painter without either the pressure imposed upon myself or the communities around me, the artistic community, the what, whoever it might be, that there's a lot of pressure when you're representing a body in the human figure, particularly black and brown bodies and the respect and the time and the care that I'm giving to them is very intentional and thought through. And not that that goes away when I'm making these smaller crop paintings, but in, in fact, they become opportunities for me to play with paint and movement and shape and color and form. And to think about how those, those simple slash not so simple gestures can reflect a lot of storytelling as well. That within reach, thinking about this painting and this young man reaching across the lap of what we assume is a caretaker based off of the gentle, what seems like a soft or relaxed touch on his back. Mm -hmm. um, and then the soft and kind of endearing touch on the set of knees to his right. That those moments um, are just as important as the picture the overall picture or a completed kind of seated portrait um, that I'm, I'm, I'm really playing. It's, I play, I, I love to play. And these are opportunities for me to do that um, mm -hmm. quite explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've often spoken of your childhood kind of exposure to artists like Romer Bed and, and others. Um, can you talk a little bit about, that and where you know how it had an impact on your yeah I think that representation matters quite yeah. simply that the biggest impact that seeing myself represented on posters or on the scale of fine arts that those images literally were a warm hug of my childhood that I knew nothing different than to see myself represented in the stories and the stories of my ancestors represented quite explicitly um, that I, it gave me a certain amount of permission to exist in my own truth. It gave me permission to pursue um, my own creative impulses, <laughs> that my desire to create and to represent the world around me um, was a valuable choice to make. Um, and, and it wasn't explicitly said and by any means growing up that that's what that was meant for, but it's subtle messaging that definitely played a huge part in the way that I've engaged um, in my painting practice as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Q, uh, this one. Yeah. yeah, Q. So as we're talking, thinking, I mean, I can't help but like think of Ramar Bearden. There's a certain collaging or the playing with foreground and backgrounds and the way that um, I personally always admired about that work that I've tried whether implicitly or like really consciously or not, to consider in my own work that there are choices that I can make that can be purely aesthetic, um, even in the practice of representing my community, that um, this was representative or a part of a body of work called Nights in Harlem that I showed at Casey Kaplan Gallery. And I was thinking really about how interior light floods onto the streets and how that changes um, potentially the, the way that light and color functions in a painting. Um, there are a lot more neons that existed in this body of work. You can see it on his feet and the way that the light hits kind of bounces off his arm. Um, 
thinking about leaving that that pole and leaving that neon green as well has been really important. Um, but he was a young man who worked as a security guard at a building nearby, and he made eye contact with me on a night that I was out photographing, photographing, and less did he know that that was just all I needed to go. <laughs> Um, so when you made eye contact, it's not everyone is just all in the eye contact. Exactly. I mean, that's why I think so many of us fear making eye contact with one another. Well, actually, when you live in New York, you're always told not to, never to make eye contact with people on the street. That it's Every actually single one of the people that I have met or painted in New York, most of them have come from doing quite the opposite an intentional choice on my behalf to look up to actually take out my headphones and to say hello to the people on my block that I see frequently. Why would I dare? Why, why can't neighborhoods and the neighborhoods function in the same way, even if we are on the street and moving through space quite quickly, that um, it, it feels like a lost opportunity if I don't stop and at least say hello. Worst that can happen is somebody says, get out my face. And at which point- It's a particularly okay. kind of urban experience. And I notice in the next one, Tito, that the light is also, um, yeah. and that was also part of that nights in Harlem body yeah. of work where, um, I was photographing at night. It was, uh, actually very close to where I photographed Q and Tito. I was photographing someone else. Actually, there's this also this like communal passing on that happens. Once you build a repertoire with people, they're more inclined to share you with others as you do when you meet someone you're like I think you should be friends with such and such that so people knew that this was a project I was doing and as I photographed Harold and um in front of a laundromat Tito came out and as the owner of that laundromat said he wanted to participate as well and he specifically wanted to be in front of a mural that was done on the side of the laundromat that represented his father um in in multiple parts or moments in his father's life so he's seated in front of these this magnificent and magnified mural of his his father behind him mm -hmm. and let's go to the next Devon and James yeah this one um is the beginning of that nights in Harlem exploration came from making this painting initially I was with Yvonne and James as the sun was setting um I was sitting on that piece of cardboard next to them having longed for my own family and friends and I had painted James previously in my practice which is this painting along with the original James is on view at the new museum currently, but I had painted James and quickly learned after getting to know James, that James and Yvonne were like two peas in a pod that Yvonne was always close by. So the fact that I caught him initially on a day where she wasn't was kind of baffling to me. And I had said to her that um, it was time for me to paint her as well and the two of them and their kind of clasping of hands, I think is very telling in the way that the light behind them is kind of spilling onto the street and it made me begin to ask those questions the dramatic shadows underneath her feet um the shadows along her arm i, I just loved that kind of contrast within the paint and the mark making um which made me think about kind of doing a more intentional body of work focused on the night and nights in harlem mm -hmm. and to the next um, yeah. Same, this is also part of Nights in Harlem, Amina. This was everybody saying, when are you going to paint men? And my quite humorous, but also intentional way of saying, well, here's 37. I mean, when are you going to paint women? And I said, okay, I bet I'm going to paint 37 women um, on the front of this building. But Amina Hair Braiding Salon is in Harlem. It was uh, an establishment I walked past every day. I There's images of Beyonce. I always kind of cracked a smile when I walked by there. There's a sense of belonging that I felt. Um, that I wanted to kind of capture and and share with others and we mm. make a difference that, That's that's definitely how I feel and I think that that's mm. represented here Yeah, let's go to glass man Michael shall we? Yeah. yeah Yeah, tell us about this one. Yeah, he's a part of um, my time at the studio museum in Harlem He was one of the early kind of portraits on the street. It was a transition for me from interiors to exteriors where I was thinking really explicitly about how the street functions as the home for many of us in places such as New York City that we um, commune on the street and 
that is no different for a Glassman Mike who literally was known on the block as Glassman Mike because what he does and did is sell glass on the street. He was the, the original cur curator as I know, knew him and tell him all the time because every day he would change his table and curate around a specific theme, whether it was like, like frogs one day, this day it was Boz's. Um, it could be any number of things that he would specify as being on the table. And I loved and was really interested in the way that people created a sense of belonging for themselves in a very public space. Mm -hmm. um, and the messaging of the community, I think, really stood strong in this body of work, in particular, Harlem Not For Sale, Fight Back, was really um, a poignant moment that that storefront that was boarded up has now turned into a taqueria or like a taco spot. So um, it was the beginning of an end of an era of Glassman Mike being able to be there. Mm -hmm. And now we're um, heading into the Visible Man series, one of your first that really, I think, drew a lot of attention. And, you know, it's, it, I mean, in, in art history, it's highly unusual, I think, to see um, male nudes, yeah. male nude paintings. And, you know, to really, um, you know, let's unpack that a little bit. I'd love to hear, you know, they were all people very well known to you fellow students. Um, so how did you convince them to pose for you first up? Uh, that was actually a really <laughs> kind of That's crazy. What I was say because it's like... I didn't start in the smartest place. Uh, I actually went to a friend at the law school first uh, who he quite quickly laughed me out the door and was like, I'm trying to be like a judge one day. What do I want with new pictures of me existing in the world? I know better than that. I was like, oh, but yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then I went to the business school, very similar reaction. They were like, we're gonna be CEOs, like not, not. And then somebody said, you know, you should go to the drama school. They get naked on stage all the time. I've been to quite a few <laughs> cabarets. And I thought, that is literally a brilliant <laughs> like observation. Of course, like, of course, where else would you go when you need somebody to Mm -hmm. participate in a project such as this. And um, I sent an, a mass email to all of the black students in the School of Drama at the time that um, were identified for me through a mutual friend at the School of Drama who collected their names and their email addresses. And I sent an email introducing myself saying that I was um, embarking upon a journey towards my thesis statement, my thesis show really. And um, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a body of work that create, that really put on the forefront, their vulnerability and their humanity as black men. Um, that my way of addressing that was to ask for them to allow me to come into their homes um, where I would photograph them nude, that their genitalia would not be um, at all displayed, but that their gaze would be strong and that they were, yeah, it, it actually took quite some time to get somebody to say yes. Um, and the first person to say yes was Jure who thought I was a man. He walked past me the day that we set, we arranged to sit in front of the school of art um, to meet one another. And he walked past me because he was expecting a man to be there because of my name. Mm. Uh, and I said, sorry, it's me. And is that still okay? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it just like changes it in my head. But once I made his painting, painting he went back to the school of drama. The other actors started seeing the paintings and wanted to participate. So then a flood kind of, um, word spread, Jordan. Spread. Word spread that there was somebody at the School of Art who was doing a body of work um, centering the lives of Black men and, and mm -hmm. Yaya being one of them. Yeah. And so how long, um, you mentioned when the first work that we showed um, of Aurora taking about three weeks. Is that the kind of, is that about the time frame of painting? Yeah. I think it varies on scale. Obviously, the smaller works take a little bit less time, but generally the process is one in which I cover the whole surface in a color. The white, it's like a blank page. I just, you just got to get rid of it. You just got to start typing somewhere. It's so the it's same covered. with writing. Yeah, exactly. So for me, my page is death. You've got to just write something. You've got to start somewhere. So for me, it's just cover the whole canvas in a color, in a wash. And then I start drawing immediately from there. I'm really invested and interested in the idea of painting from life. Although I'm not painting from life, that photography is a tool for me to access um, these fleeting moments, but I work with a certain amount of immediacy or constraints on time. I, I work wet and wet. For example, in this painting of Yai or Elijah, 
his entire face would have been painted in one seating. And then I would have done an arm or his chest and another kind of sex chunk of time. And then I would do a leg and then I would do the bed and, and I never go back in and make adjustments mm -hmm. that part of what That's unusual for oil painters, no? Very unusual. Oil painters usually rework and rework yeah. and rework. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm really, I, I try not to edit. For me, it is about kind of the emotional connection between me and the subject and um, not second guessing myself. I can't believe I set those parameters up in graduate school when everything is about second guessing yourself. But I, maybe I needed that. And I have fallen in love with that process as a result that um, there's a great amount of freedom in just allowing myself to go and not think about it and then just being with it and seeing what happens. Yeah. And then our final image is uh, Galen. This one of Galen. So he, this was one of the last ones that I did um, in this body of work. And I think what's nice about it is it holds all the things that were the most important to me at this time and continue to be, which is the direct gaze, um, the, the play and the freedom of play around color and color choice, particularly as it relates to skin tone. I, I loved the idea that people would approach the body of work that I had made and say that she's painting black men and then they would have to kind of second guess themselves and say, wait, he's green. I was looking a lot at Bob Thompson um, that I was thinking about how color and the mosaic of my family and the way the color exists in the spectrum of my family is quite vast and that I, I didn't want to be limited in a palette in any capacity. Um, I, I just allowed my imagination to kind of take reign that there was never a re rhyme or reason to why I did green or blue or any number of colors. Um, but once I made a decision similar to making the paintings, I just didn't second guess it. And I would, I would see it through to the end. How did he react to being green? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I actually don't remember at this point, because he was so much later in the process, I think he wasn't super surprised because I had painted Jure kind of a greenish tone and his colleague, um, Jonathan was like a blue, he's very kind of, tiled he's actually like red and blue and green all together so I think he was like cool I but if you were to ask my nephew when I painted him blue he was like why am I blue I look sad and I was like oh that's deep I wasn't trying to do that um so ask a six-year-old at the time and they'll probably give me a more honest answer about how they felt about it yeah well, Jordan, we've kind of come to the end of the images that we'd planned to share tonight. And I was very struck by um, a statement that you made about your practice. And you said that you're really looking for the authentic version, the most authentic version of the world that you could find. Um, just to close out before we take questions, what, how, how would you elaborate on that? I mean, hearing you say that as something I have said, it is. <laughs> Sorry, I looked at all the interviews and there is some it's good. fantastic quotes, actually. But. I, say, I think authenticity is a, is a word that is very frequent in my vocabulary. It's something that I'm deeply invested in in my own life and the relationships that I have, that I thrive when I feel seen, that much of my life, I don't know if I, I, I felt like I was functioning on the periphery in some capacity in various spaces. Um, so to feel seen and to give space for others to feel seen alongside me um, mm -hmm. and with as much care and respect and acknowledgement and responsibility and just like honesty, I just, I just want to be honest about who I am and I want to be honest about who it is that I'm portraying and um, that centers around a certain amount of authenticity. For me, that's when I hear or use the word authenticity, it relates back to the intentions and um, the integrity of the work itself. And holding on to that is, is very important to me. And it's, these are real people. And even in installing the show at the new museum that um, it's, it's very profound when you get to experience an opening where the subjects are there themselves and it's a celebration. And I, I think that the openings, which hopefully return in some distant future again is that um yeah they become celebratory that is that is authentic that no one is um off in a corner wondering who and how they best exist that they just get to be themselves mm. okay.
Well, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thank um, you. We have a few questions, actually, and there have been a couple of questions about Alice Neal. Oh, you and I talked about it a little bit earlier, but <laughs> talk a little bit about whether you would recognise Alice Neal as um, an artist that whose work has affinity with your thinking. Very much so. As I'm sitting at my desk in my studio, I have an Alice Neal in Vermont book that I was looking at yesterday spending time upstate and like doing landscape painting and thinking about um, how things in life transition from whether it's urban spaces in the city or going into the exterior spaces and painting the landscape of someplace like upstate New York that Alice Neal was one of the first artists that I encountered um, quite early in my career. It was like right before I went to graduate school, I was given um, a book of hers as just like a, a random gift. I can't even remember who gave it to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I was awestruck. It felt like the first, speaking of authenticity, it was the first time that I felt like I was seeing humanity in its whole breadth of, of existence, that it was, the good, the bad, the ugly, it was raw, it was unapologetic, it was um, the way she used light and color and shadow and the way that she created marks and her confidence in mark making and representing what it was that she was seeing, that I felt like I was seeing the world through her eyes. And I thought, if there's any way that I can do something similar in my lifetime, that would be a gift. So there's no question that I think about her and her work a lot. Um, as someone who was acutely aware of who she was and how her body existed in the environments that she was in, um, and then wanting to share the people that she was encountering with others and tell a story of, of humanity, really. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a couple of questions about your actual painting process, whether it's drawing, painting, how you build color into those kinds of details. I wonder if you could elaborate just about how you approached that painting surface. Yeah, so um, I, color is one of those things that I am obsessed with. I had a yellow room growing up. I had a periwinkle room growing up. I've always been, even as I'm sitting in an all white jacket and an all white room, it's not really very well reflective of who I am as a person and the things around me. I love color um, and so I've never been afraid of color. I feel a great am amount of emotion from it. So I mm -hmm. use things like color aids um, as tools which are just glorified paint chips. I tell my students all the time just like go to the hardware store and grab mm -hmm. every color along the paint chip aisle, cut them up, throw them in a bag and then throw them on the floor whenever you're getting ready to start a painting and just start playing. Think about new relationships between color and so I start in a similar fashion in the sense that I um, and making decisions about color in advance that I'm kind of methodical in my planning. My, as you see, my studio is pretty clean. So I am like a, a little bit maybe atypical as an artist in that I'm kind of type A. Um, I like to be really organized and so that by the time I approach the canvas that I can be free. <laughs> free at last kind of like happens after I've done all my preparation. I've mixed all my colors. I've decided my palette in advance. I've thought about, I've drawn out the composition. I don't change the composition once I've started drawing it. And then by the Is time- it a process in a sketchbook first? Do you do a drawing on a paper or it's directly onto the canvas? Directly on canvas. The first time I draw it um, is on canvas. So I take that photograph or multiple photographs really and have them all printed. And I begin to just play with the composition using Gamasol or paint thinner to wipe away as my eraser um, and then the brush with paint on it as my additive, it is my pencil. Um, and I, I go for maybe two to three hours of kind of settling on a composition, bringing things in or out of view um, nothing is additive that wasn't already in that space. So nothing's imaginative. Language that was in the space is the only language that will show up on a canvas or in a work of art um, of mine. That colors are probably the place where I play the most. Compositionally, you know, I'll move things over or put something out that maybe is distracting that um, I'm using tools such as leaving the underpainting in some, cons in some of the compositions. Um, so that the, the eye can travel kind of seamlessly through from one corner to the other. So I'm thinking about balance and light and, and how to bring that into focus. Um, but yeah, there's once I'm, I don't do a whole lot of planning except for, for color. Um, 
in advance. And then once I've started painting, it's game over. I'm, I'm in it. Mm -hmm. And I think our final question, because we're a little pressed uh, for time, yeah. is um, what's next? What are you what's next? And in fact, the question was, what are your dreams? What are your artistic dreams? Oh, my artistic dreams are ever growing. I think because of, I, in some ways, um, every experience like this, this would have been a dream yesterday. And in this moment right now, I feel like that dream is being fulfilled as um, people are engaging in this conversation with us and are interested in kind of hearing these stories and hearing my story as I've come to be in this moment. But I think my dream long term is to continue to paint, um, to continue to center my mental and physical health, um, the mental and physical health of my loved ones. I, I, I want to find balance. I think that is in essence, all that I can ask for. And the things that I'm confident of and know because my entire life it has proved to be true is that I'm gonna be painting, you know, that paintings will be made. Um, I will continue to be a part of the paintings being made because um, I don't know how else to be or live or exist. <laughs> um, so that, that's like a non-negotiable, but I'll continue to show as long as people wanna see. I'll continue to talk and teach I love to teach, you know, that those are things that I'm passionate about. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight, Jordan. It was a real honor. It was a real honor to be here tonight. Thank you. And with thank everybody you. listening. That well, I can see. Thank you for those who asked questions. My apologies to those that we didn't get to this evening. And thank you to all of you. Um, it's, it's been a real pleasure to be able to do this, even if it's virtual. Thank you so much. And please join us for another Hershon program. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.